Okay, we're going to sing. We're going to sing 120 in the red book. Victory in Jesus. <laughs> Are you ready? Since we don't have a piano player, I'm going to tune it in. One, two, three. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory. cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and some sweet Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory. Praise. 
everybody to come down. Let's just reach around and fellowship, please. for tonight. For those of us not here tonight, we certainly want to remember each and every one that's not here. And like I said, we've got many, many requests that uh, I'm sure that we've got our list not up on the board, but uh, we certainly got quite a few people still yet we need to remember tonight. Anybody have one that you want to remember? I know Sister Michelle, she's not here. Hazel's not here. I know... Um, Maggie, she con continues to want us to remember her sister tonight, so I'll certainly remember her. Anybody else? Amen. I certainly remember this. right that's good it's good that people can look at you and see that in you too that's the main thing i know uh, we've been studying quite a bit in our sunday school class with uh, the homelessness uh, as landon has been teaching for the past two or three weeks but that should be another burden that we each have is uh, to remember the homeless people those that are less fortunate than most of us so we need to thank god for that anyone else have a request all right, those that will, let's, let's come on into the altar and let's pray and take it before the Lord. for the evening offering, please.
Let's not forget uh, choir practice will be starting uh, next Sunday uh, at five o'clock. Also, uh, another mention on the Winterfest for the young children as, as well as adults. You're all invited January the 21st. Those who would like to attend, it's $15. And also tomorrow night, the ladies will be meeting uh, at 6.30. So everybody just that can come, come on up. Anybody have a special song on their heart tonight? All right, Brother Anthony. Someday the stammering tongue will falter no more, and a grander, sweeter song I shall sing. For I'll join the ransom choir on heaven's bright shore, and forever to praise to the King. And while the ages roll, I'll keep on praising Him. And my voice will never tire or grow old. And my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me. And I'll sing it while ages shall roll. When a million years have passed in that wonderful place, my song of praise will just have begun. For all my joy will never end while I look on his face, and my song will never be done. And while the ages roll, I'll keep on praising him, and my voice will never tire or grow old. And my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll. Amen. Amen. Anybody else have a song on their heart? All right. Brother Bobby, if you will, please. Don't forget your credit card. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Had y'all been here early enough, you'd know what he was talking about. Yeah, it's, I've tried my best to steer this church away from that kind of behavior, but <laughs> nothing I say or do. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, if you'll come a little bit early for Sunday night and Wednesday night, we make coffee and we've got desserts back in the fellowship hall. We just sit around and have a good time fellowship Amen. and get here kind of early. And uh, we just enjoy ourselves. Amen. Amen. All right. You know where we're going back to Luke chapter number 24, verse 50. Praise the Lord for the wonderful service he sent this morning. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse number 50. And he, talking about the Lord Jesus, led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Fathers, we bow before you once again, thanking you for yet another opportunity to stand and proclaim your precious word. God, we pray, Lord, for the power of God upon this message, for the words to say, God, that you would give us discernment of the scriptures. Lord, you would guide each and every word that's spoken. Lord, you'd search our hearts. You know what we stand in need of. Lord, we thank you publicly again for the wonderful spirit that you sent here this morning, how you blessed us tremendously. Lord, we're asking if you would just show up again tonight in the preaching, Lord, and just bless what we do. We'll be so very careful to give you all the praise. And God, we 
not only that, but Father, we pray, God, for a victory over this world. Lord, this world has such an influence on us, seems like six days a week. And Lord, coming into your house is where we get cleansed. And Father, we pray tonight once again for the power of God upon this message. And Lord, the presence of God in this meeting. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. For it's in Christ Jesus' precious holy name we do pray. And amen. amen. Y'all yeah, started out a message this morning is that Jesus led his disciples. And everything that he did throughout the three and a half years they followed him, whether it be something wonderful, great, whether it be a miracle of a healing, or whether it be a storm that he took them through, he was teaching them how to face life. And as I mentioned in the prayer after the scripture, have you ever thought about the influence that the world has on you and me and every born-again Christian as how we try to separate from the influence of the world, come into God's presence in his house, and try to worship the Lord Jesus Christ by having been influenced all week in the world? You can't turn a TV on without some kind of filth or something suggestive. <coughs> you can't hardly go to work without somebody at that work talking and saying things that they shouldn't have. You can't send your kids to school without them being influenced by the wicked. You can't go to the grocery store or pump gas or anything else unless you're surrounded or come up on contact with somebody that's got a devil's tongue. And so we got to un allow God to undo everything that's been done to us by way of influence to where we can come in his house and worship. We got to be cleansed. And after the songs are sang and the prayers are prayed and, and the message is preached, somewhere in that process, hopefully God has got enough of the world knocked off of us that now he can get in. Do you realize what God has to contend with just to bless us? We've, we've got six days where the world's just bombarded us through TV and life. And now he gives us the word of life, which ain't what you get to see on TV anymore. And what we experience in a worship service in our church family and our sanctuary isn't what you get outside this sanctuary. And so God says, when you come together, I've got to get all that out of you so that I can put something into you that'll help you when you go back out and, and get exposed to that again. And as I preached this morning, I started out that he led them because what he had to do in three and a half years was give them whatever it was he could give them through life situations that they could get through the rest of their life. Because you understand, I'm 65, God's still letting me live, I've got more living to do, so I need to be able to face whatever I have to face. You know, he, the song that says, as long as he lives, I can face tomorrow. Tomorrow's never going to get here. All we've got is today. And so today is the day that we have set aside on a Sunday to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to squeeze everything we can out of today to help us when we go face, tomorrow, face that tomorrow. Now, when tomorrow gets here, it'll still be today. We'll never see it tomorrow. But we need to plan just like we're going to. In Luke chapter number 7, I ain't going to turn there, but you'll know it is. The widow of Nain, her widow being a widow, she already had the title widow with her, so she'd already buried a husband. And Jesus has got his disciples, and they know what it's like to give sight to a blind man, give mobility to a lame man, give hearing to a deaf man, and speech to a man that's mute. He, he, they know all that. But now he's about to show them something that they didn't think was ever possible. He was about to raise the dead and give a mother back her son. And so we're going to realize here, just as I hope as this thing goes on tonight, in the fact of it is, is one of the times in your life and mine that we need God the most is in the death of a loved one. You're facing a loss, you're facing a separation, you're facing when your life has completely changed. When a wife loses a husband, 
And now she's facing this world alone without him by her side to do everything that he's always done. Or when you got a husband that's walking through life without his wife, that changes. Listen, death takes a whole lot more than the life of a loved one. Death takes the person that you would share a conversation with, that you'd give your feelings to, that you could share life with, that you could lean on in the times that you were weak, that would get you through what you couldn't get through yourself. And one of the worst things that we go through life is being alone. And if you're used to having somebody in your life that you'd always depended on, that was a friend that, that you could depend that would always be there for you, and that person ain't there anymore because death has came and claimed their life, then you're, fine, you're going to find yourself, you're in a whole new world by yourself, except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, I know that there's coming a day where I'm going to reunite, where we're going to rapture everybody out, and I'm going to put the family back together. But in the meantime, we need to learn that we can walk with the Lord Jesus Christ even through the worst tragedies of our life. And I can't think of a worse tragedy for you and me to face than the loss of somebody we love. We've experienced it. We know how bad it hurts. But we also know by Bible example that even when that time comes, we've got God with us. And so when you look at Luke chapter number 7, they, she, she's already buried her husband. She's now in the, on the way into the, into the burial site, into the graveyard, the cemetery. And her son, her only son, she's alone in the world. And the last family member, the Bible says that she had, his dead body is laying in a casket. They've got the mourners around them. And that's something I want to talk to you about just for a few minutes. The only voices that she could hear was the voices that he's gone. You're by yourself. You're all alone. He can't do for you anymore. You're going to face life without any kind of help. She was a woman that was alone and the society of her day that she lived in nobody would come to help her nobody would pay a house payment nobody would fix a light nobody would get her to the store nobody would care about if something was broke or not she was in society she was all by herself and all the voices that she heard were it's too late it's gone there's no hope hope is all gone and lady you're here and you're just going to have to suffer through it because there ain't no fix this. How many knows that when you got a funeral going on or you're at the cemetery, they'll give you hope for a future. They'll give you hope for a rapture. But who can give you hope for the days before the rapture takes place? Amen. What he's trying to do is to let this woman know that when you least expect it and the people that are surrounding you and the people that are supposed to be there to encourage you and the people that are there to try to help you and all you're getting is bad news. It's over it's too bad it's finished just give up and just to go on and the mourners that surrounded her that day had no hope no good word nothing that would lift her spirits up nothing that would get her through the day and even more so get her through the night but thank God that ain't the only voice that was in the cemetery that day is that Jesus was leading his disciples he led them through the uh, uh, fixing illness he led them through helping someone he led them through a casting out demons now he's leading them through to the cemetery where it looks like by all appearances it's too late. There's nothing he can do. But he's about to show them there's a difference between the true and the living God and everybody else. They're, the mourners are all mourning and they're professional mourners and they're, <coughs> they're paid mourners and they're to make you feel as bad and sad as they possibly can. They're there not to give you any kind of hope. They're there to make you feel just as bad as bad can possibly make you feel. They ain't there to lift your spirits, give you any guidance, help you throughout the day, get you through your problems. They're simply there to make worse, way worse than what worse is. Are you hearing me tonight? And the fact of it is, there's all the mourners, that's death, that's who he incorporates, that's who the devil sends out, that's all she had to choose from. But because God called some men one day and led them through life and says, come on, we're going through, we're about to show Israel who I am and what I'm capable of. And because God got those men and those men saw him create, they perform miracle after miracle, he led them and not only just them, but thank God there was a mom 
multitude that walked with him and the disciples, they'd already seen the miracles. They'd already seen people healed. They'd already seen him take authority over the devil. They'd seen him calm the storms out at sea. And they're about to see him do something that nobody else could do. He is going to walk into a cemetery. He's going to stop that funeral procession. He's going to touch that dead boy. And he's about to do what he did for Adam in the Garden of Eden. Are you hearing me tonight? Adam was nothing more than a clay vessel. Adam had no life about in him whatsoever. But thank God when the God of all creation got down upon his knees and breathed the breath of life, Adam came a living soul. And he's about to show them what they weren't around to see a creation when he created Eden. Amen. He's about to show them that, bless God, I'm going to bow one more time. But I'm not bound to pray just for the prayer. I'm bound and to pray to bring life back into him. And when nobody could see it coming, when nobody thought it was possible, he showed his disciples. He reversed the funeral process. He brought that boy's life back into him. He gave a mother back her son. He changed the whole thing. And bless God, revival broke out in the middle of a cemetery. Bless God, don't tell me you wouldn't have shouted if it was you. You're still there at the cemetery. They're in that they're in that casket. And bless God, it's all over. There ain't nothing you can do because it ain't never been done before. Jesus happens to walk through that cemetery. Next thing you know, the lid flops open. They come up and set up and they start talking. Amen. He's given us a little pre-rapture of what was going to take place on a bigger scale. But what he wanted was his disciples to know that I want you to know that when you left everything and you began to follow me, it was more than just fishers of men. It was more than just preaching the gospel. It was about turning around what the death and the devil put upon somebody and reversing that process and taking those tears and turning them into tears of joy and taking that mourn and taking turn it in into a shout. Are you hearing me tonight, church? And the fact of it is, they had no idea what they were in for. They had no idea what he was capable of. They had no idea from one day to the next what it was he was going to show them what he was going to do. Let me tell you something. He's a whole lot more than a teacher. He's more than a preacher. He's more than a rabbi. He's more than a master. He's saying, let me tell you something. Not only can I heal every disease that ever has been known, I don't care if it's leprosy, blindness, lameness, whatever it is he said I'll heal it he said I can cast out every devil that's ever been cast out of heaven I'll cast it out of mankind but he said let me tell you I'm going to do something nobody else can do he said I'm going to raise the dead I'll put their life back in them I did it at the garden of Eden I know what I'm doing I know what I'm capable of but may I remind you tonight that it's the Lord Jesus Christ that holds the life of everybody in his hand whether you be saved or whether you not and the fact of it is that life left that body I know where it is I've got a hold of it I brought it with me amen you may not have seen it but I didn't come into this cemetery empty handed I knew where I was going to be I knew what time it would be I knew what would be going on and I got here just right in the nick of time and when I touched that casket and I saw the compassion and I saw the brokenness of that poor mama I just couldn't take it anymore I put his life back into his body and said get up from there mama here's your boy I brought him back to you he never expected him to show up with that boy's life in his hand but thank God when he they, he called his disciples they got to see something they'd never seen before had they not forsaken everything and followed the Lord Jesus Christ they'd have never seen that happen that's what I'm trying to tell you is the more you and me walk with him the more that we get to see it'll be a whole lot more than the amount of trash figure It'll be more than going through a storm. It'll be more than raising the dead. The more time we walk with him and the more time we spend with him, the more we're going to see what he can do. Amen. 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 All she had in her heart and her ear was the voices of the mourners. But it's when the multitudes that followed Jesus showed up is when it began to change. They'd already seen some of what he can do, but they still hadn't ever seen this happen. 
what I am telling you is this. If more people surrender their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, if more people get plugged back into church, if more people be faithful to the house of God when they're supposed to be here, if more people pick that Bible back up and read and study, more people would pray, and the more people would become the multitude that gets to see what God is capable of. We don't get to see what he's capable of, but every once in a while we get a glimpse. That's because we're no longer the multitude that follows him around this earth anymore. We're the multitude that's too busy. We're the multitude that's got other things to do. We're the multitude that it's only a time of convenience. But if we'd ever surrender everything and follow the, and follow the Lord Jesus Christ like them 12 disciples did when he called them away, did they need to make money? You better know it. But you don't find where they ever worked a job again after they surrendered to him. But did they eat every day? You better know it. Did Peter's mother-in-law and his wife eat? You better Better believe God took care of them. Did they ever have to worry, worry about what they were going to eat, where they're going to live, what they were going to wear? He took care of every need they ever had. The problem with the New Testament church is we worry about how we're going to do it through the Lord Jesus Christ when all we got to do is surrender to Him and He'll take care of it. Amen. We ain't got but a handful of people in this church, but you look at what God's doing. God said, if that's all I've got, it's fine. If all we ever are is two fishes and five loaves, as long as we're two fishes and five loaves in the hand in the hands of the Lord God, let Him bless us, let Him break us, and let Him send us out. Amen. I've about quit worrying and fretting about how many's here and how many ain't. I'm just going to strip the hide off the ones of you who can show up. Amen. Let me go ahead and preach on i got more i got to preach about. You see, when you walk in the past death and in the past no hope, that's exactly what you're going to get. They'd been to funeral after funeral after funeral. It ain't never happened like that before. It ain't never happened that anybody's ever raised up. It ain't never happened that anybody ever got better. It ain't ever happened that you could find joy in the midst of a funeral and in the joy in the midst of a death. But ain't that exactly what happened at this time? I have seen and preached funerals and where they just come running and slide under the casket and get saved. I've seen them where they've shouted like we was in a revival. What I am trying to tell you is this. If God doesn't raise the dead right there out of the casket right at the graveyard there's coming a day he promised that he's going to walk right back through that same cemetery bless God you better raise your hand to me tonight and the fact of it is is that just what he did in name he's going to do one day for us just like he walked through that cemetery and he stopped that and he raised that boy up what's it going to be like dear friend on the rapture of the church when he walks through every cemetery throughout this entire world and he undoes what death had already did and he undoes do is what the devil said couldn't be undone and he raises those caskets and that graves burst open and that one that we put in the ground is coming back up out of the ground bless God church we got something to shout about because if you'll follow him one day you'll get to see him walk through the cemeteries of this world and raise the dead amen, amen. amen. you see Death usually brings the time of no hope. I know hearts are broken. I know tears are shed. I know that you, there's a lot of emotional attachment. I know that life for the living is going to change at the death of a loved one. I know all that. I'm like most everybody in this church. We've been through it. But I want you to understand that in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the crying, in the midst of the broken, there's a little bit of joy. Because you see, you understand, me and you are like the disciples. I've seen the miracles. I know the God. I know he's on his way. And I know that I ain't that funeral home by myself. And I know when we stand there and the last time that you'll ever walk together, your family, is the fact of it is when you walk from the, carry that casket from the hearse and place it at the cemetery at the gravesite that's open. That's the last time your family 
we'll walk together on this side of glory. But every step we take, dear friend, is the fact of it is that God's walking right there beside each and every one of us. And as the minister preaches that burial service, and as he stands up there, there's a God that's beside every family member with a broken heart. And he's there and he's giving you courage. And he's saying, just remember the widow of Nain. If I don't do it today, there's a day coming soon and very soon. I'm going to undo what you're having to go through right now. He's saying and he gives us the fact that we know that whosoever's in that casket, their life is before Almighty God right now. They've already started the shouting. They've done in revival because another was done got home. But he said, I'm going to give you enough to get you through until that day where I actually come down and touch that casket and I raise them back up. How many in this church knows tonight we've got a God that's going to raise our dead one day and thank God he's going to stop that funeral and thank God we're coming to a day. There'll never be another burial. There'll never be another funeral priest. There'll never be another death in anybody's family. We ain't got to worry about that no more. Because we've went from no hope to the God of all hope. Notice that all, the, all they could feel was depression and broken hearted. Yes, depression comes in when you know that your life is never going to be the same on this side of glory. But God is a God that will help you through the times where you can't walk by yourself, when you can't stand anymore, when you can't face the reality of what your reality has just now become. We've got a God that will put a nail-scarred hand around your shoulder and he'll say, lean on me, I've got you. If you're heavy burdened, if you're broken down, if you're broken hearted, thank God we've got a God that will hold you together, that will give you just enough that you're willing to take another breath and take another step and walk just a little bit farther he's saying I won't give you enough that's just going to take you all the way in one day but I want you to understand however far you go today I've went that far with you and when you're tired and you need a break and you've got to sit down and you just need God just to love on you and God to bless you and God to strengthen you we'll just quit walking and we'll fellowship and you'll let God love upon you and let God take care of you he's saying it ain't all about the journey it ain't ain't about how far you go every day it's about walking with me and if it's just a little way thank God we'll go that little way together so God gives us what we need we go from depressed and broken hearted oh thank God for the multitude of believers let me tell you some of the best friends you'll have going through a time of bereavement is somebody that's already been there before and it's listen to me it's not the fact that God puts somebody in your life that knows what it's like to bury a loved one we've all done that but it's when God puts somebody in your life that when you are burying that one and you've already done it they've already been there but you see they've walked with the multitudes they've heard the voice of Almighty God. They felt the presence of those nail-scarred hands. He's saying, let them, they'll say, let me tell you what, when it was the darkest it's ever been, and I was the loneliest I've ever been in my life, I could feel the presence of heaven come down where I was at. I could feel the touch of that nail-scarred hand. I could hear the whisper of the voice that has calmed the seas and calmed the storms. And let me tell you, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't unbearable. I know that it hurts, but thank God he was was with me and he's with you too it's got listen to the multitude that's already been where you're at right now Amen. and so God puts multitudes of believers in our life to help us through the tragedy because when it first happened she wasn't used to this believer how many knows that we've pretty much all of us has been brought up that when there's a time of death and it's a loved when you're supposed to be quiet and you're supposed to you're supposed to be this way and you can't show emotion and you got to cry and you got to keep it within and it's all bad and it's all unbearable and it's all can't be fixed. And then here comes along a multitude that says, buddy, let's go ahead and shout a little bit. Let's go ahead and rejoice. Let's just lift our hand up in victory because we're lost on this side. We're hurting on this side. But if we'll just take a second to know what they're going through on the other side, they ain't mourning up in heaven. They just welcome somebody else home. You see, we got to be introduced to the multitude of believers that's already seen what he can do. And they share what 
he's done with somebody that's never seen what he's done. And that's the encouragement that it takes to get somebody through a funeral and a burial and the loss of a loved one because all she ever knew was one side. All she ever knew was loss, 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 loss. But may I remind you tonight that when Jesus came to that funeral and when he came to that burial site and he came to that cemetery, he was given something back. He wasn't taking anything. Do you understand what I'm telling you tonight? He was bringing that boy back. He had life in his words. He had life in his hands. He had life in his authority. And everything death had just taken away from her. He was, bless God, putting it right back. He was giving back what death had stole from her. And not only that, but may I remind you that he gave her more than the life of her son back that day. He gave her the joy that it came back, came with it. He gave her the victory that came with it. Everything that death took from her that she would have never gotten back had it not been for God and the multitude and the disciples that followed him, she wouldn't know what that really restored joy was you see he didn't give her just the life of her son back church he gave her everything and then some because now she knew what it was like to lose and gain again and if you've ever lost something that was so dear to you and then you found it it means so much more to you than it's ever meant But he led them. I don't know what it would have been like to have been a disciple following him, but could you imagine? You saw the blind receive their sight for the first time. But then again, you got to see it again because Jesus is not a one-trick pony. Do you want to understand? He can do more than just one thing one time. Several people got their sight back. Several people that everybody else give up on. The man at the pool of Bethesda, 38 years, nobody cared this close to healing, never got nothing until Jesus walked by one day. Been here 38 years, went right straight to him, pick up your bed and walk. Let me preach on. They'd seen the past miracles. Jesus showed his authority over life and death. Nobody else had ever done that, had they? Oh, they would offer a sacrifice and they would have a ceremony, but you couldn't reverse death. You want to know why Jesus couldn't do that and nobody else could? Here's another one of them credit card answers. (laughs) Nobody ever had life in this world until Jesus gave it. There wasn't an animal that breathed. There wasn't a tree or a bush, and there certainly wasn't mankind. That was the last gift that he gave mankind at creation, and that was the gift of life. It came from him. It stays with him. He holds it. He owns it. He's the authority over it, and he's the dispenser of it. And he brought it to a cemetery to one woman because there was just something about what he could do with his disciples and that multitude. Even the multitudes wasn't expecting what he did. They thought, well, he'll comfort them. He'll pray with her. He'll encourage her. He'll tell her one day, even they believed that one day there was a resurrection. But it's when Jesus does something unexpected right now. I don't know about you, but I live in the anticipation when we come to God's house in this church and have service. I'm looking for God to do something he ain't never done just to show us he can and bless us with it. I ain't going to limit God. I want God to be as much God right here in this church today as he was in them gospels. So I ain't going to limit him like he can't. I'm just saying, God, just do it. There's the press, and he put on revival. He was giving them a pre-rapture, was he not? Let me just move on ahead. Because it absolutely did something, church, that had never been done. 
The focus was now on Jesus instead of death. You ever notice preachers would be preaching a burial site and a funeral? And most of the time, we, and I, I do it too, we preach on the God of hope one day. You know, that blessed day, that day that we're waiting on. I got to where I do things a little different. I want to preach on the fact is God will bless you in the midst of your suffering right today. Amen. We don't wait till one day to get that blessing. And see, now their hope, was, their hope was on Jesus. Their focus was on Jesus. They weren't thinking about him. It was all about the death of a son and the burial of a son and the tragedy of a mother. But when Jesus showed up at the cemetery in the midst of her tragedy, now everybody's focus was on the Lord Jesus Christ, was it not? I'm telling you, sometimes God will show up in the midst of a tragedy, introduce himself, and change what's going on that day. But we've gotten to the place where we're really surprised when God does something out of the ordinary. Listen, we need to get to where we can expect it, welcome it, encourage it, ask for it. Because what did he do that day? He did more than just stop a burial, did he not? Hang on, since I get a drink of water, I'll tell you what it is. I know I've said this before, but it's tough on an old man my age trying to preach a 20-year-old preacher's message. Notice this. Jesus did more than just stop the funeral procession. He did more than just stop the burial Anybody can walk up to a funeral and stop what's going on. I've seen it happen. Especially if they show up the funeral drunk. Oh, don't act like it ain't never happened. You've never preached a funeral in Campbell County, have you? Matter of fact, when I was a boy, that was almost standard operating procedure. Was it not? Donna knows what I'm talking about. He did more than just stop a funeral. Anybody can stop a funeral. But only he can reverse it. He put that thing in reverse and said, oh, no, no, no. You may have thought you were here for a funeral. You may have thought you were going to bury this boy. You may have thought this was the end of that. You may have thought that that was the final thing. But he said, oh, no, no, no. And he did more than just stop what was going on. He did more than stop. He reversed that back. He brought the boy back. He put life where there was death. He took that mama who had a broken heart. And I can see her just leaping for joy. I have no idea idea what that boy said to his mother but when Jesus picked him up and bought him by the hand and took him out of that casket on wheels and put his hand in the hand of his mother what I think broke out number one you had a family reunion that never happens at a funeral or a burial God doesn't put them back together one go family goes away and the deceased goes into the ground but not on this day Jesus showed up and they had a family reunion first of all he let them take their time. He let them rejoice with one another. He let them shout to victory. He let those mama's tears of broken hearts are now our tears of joy. And God undid what the de- what death had already done. The first thing they had was uh, they had a, a family reunion. The second thing they did, they began to glorify Almighty God. Now everybody knew who He was. Now everybody knew what He was capable of doing. And now everybody didn't limit God for a little while. And the fact of it is that revival broke out in the midst of a burial time in the, in the cemetery of the city of night. What I am telling you is this, is that God can break out revival in the midst of our suffering. And if you, lead, if you let him follow, if you follow him, and if you let him lead you, one day you're going to get to witness that. Amen. So God did something that had never been done before. You see, Jesus took authority over life and death, which was more than what he had already taken authority over. 
Did he not already take authority over sickness? Did he not already take authority over fear? But now he's showing them he and he alone. That time he stood after Lazarus been dead, and he stood at the, at the opening of that tomb and just said, roll the stone away. Nobody believed he could do it. You see, you've got to understand, it's the, we're being taught in the day that we live in that if we come up with just the right two or three verses, if we'll say just the right King James English when we pray, if we'll fashion just the right carefully worded prayer that impresses others, then God is going to answer our prayers. Let me just clue you in on something while we're all here together tonight. How many, what kind of a prayer did that woman with the issue of blood pray just before she touched the hem of his garment? She said within herself, I, she never prayed a prayer. She never asked him for one thing. But she said within herself without him ever knowing a word, if I can just get close enough to touch the hem of his garment, I won't ask him nothing. I ain't going to pray a prayer. I ain't even going to stop this. I'll just let him keep walking I don't need him to drag me down the road I don't need a big showing I don't need to put, do anything but if I can just come up behind him without a word and I can touch him his garment by faith I know that I'm going to be made whole when the apostle Peter was sinking in the sea of Galilee and the storm was raging around him he didn't have time for a formal prayer He all, all the words he ever said was Lord save me and before he ever got the first word out God is already there he had already had his hand extended and in the midst of the sea what I am trying to tell you is this if you'll just follow God and if you'll just let him lead you through life and if you'll just trust him and you just look upon him it ain't about the prayer you put together it ain't about the two or three verses you think's going to twist his arm it's about the fact is you're where you need to be so that God can help you when he's ready to help you Wasn't it 12 years the woman with the issue of blood sought every doctor and was no better for it but now broke, sick, and almost on the, on the threshold of death? She put herself where she needed to be when God was ready to help her. So what am I going to leave you with tonight is simply this right here. If you'll just let God lead you and I'll let him lead me through life. If we'll just do that, then we will always be the, in the place where God wants us to be when he's ready to do for us what he needs to do for us. They followed him, not expecting to have a race from the dead. They never followed him, not expecting him to lead them through a cemetery. They followed him, not knowing from one day to the next. How many times in the Gospels can you read where God ever told them the day before and held it up, this is what we're going to do tomorrow? Have you ever found that? You ain't going to either. I've read the four Gospels a time or two. God says simply follow me. When he called them from that fishing trip, what I preached this morning, did he tell them every single thing that he was going to do every day? Did they get an itinerary? They just followed him. Has that changed in 20 and 23? No, it has not. If you will trust God, get back to this blessed book. Quit trying to figure out everything according to what you see on TV or what somebody else has wrote. Just trust this blessed book. Just go back to the God of these Gospels and follow Him, trust Him, and look at Him and don't worry about anything else. He will put you into the place where He can touch you and whatever it is you've been praying for and want, He already knows that before you ever pray the first prayer. You're in the place where God wants you to be and then He'll answer it according to His perfect will. It's simple, is it not? I pastor this church on this right here. The foundation that I preach on and pastor you on is based on the foundation of this blessed book. It is the Word of God. I ain't building it on a gimmick. I ain't building it on a trend. I ain't building it on what everybody else might be doing. That's them. We're an independent Baptist church. I'll build this church on the Word of Almighty God and that's it. And that's how to stay. 
It's like I said before, you may get another preacher sometime, but you'll never get one as pretty as me. I've seen the proof. I looked in the mirror when I was getting ready tonight. If I just had one of those mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the handsomest preacher of them all? And if that mirror says anything other than Preacher Bobby. Yeah, I know. I'm done preaching. I'm just fooling with you now. Anybody got anything on their mind or their heart? Because I'm going to have to quit right here. I'm going to have to pick this up next week and the week after and the week after and the week after. But I fully intend for us to see a multitude of Bible examples of how God trains us for life. And what we get out of this book will help us through whatever we face. Because if you, if you ain't ready for it yourself, as long as you're letting God lead you and you're looking for Him, you ain't got to worry about it. He'll take care of the hard stuff. Anybody got anything on their mind or their heart before we dismiss? All right, boys, it got to be right about the end of the service. This has got to be the quietest group of people. All right, where's all the young people ready? If y'all ain't asleep, come on. Uh, tomorrow night, 6.30.